I'm Greg Johnson. Welcome to CounterCurrents Radio. My guest today is F. Roger Devlin. Hi, Greg. Good to be here. Roger Devlin is the author of one of our best-selling books, Sexual Utopia in Power. He's the author of many, many articles at CounterCurrents, at American Renaissance, and at other websites. And recently, he reviewed a book called Deaths of Despair and the Future of Capitalism by a husband and wife academic couple. And the topic is, is extremely important because this is about the rise of mortality in middle-aged, middle-class, and working-class white people that has been recently discovered. So I thought we would just discuss this because it's a very important topic with a lot of really important implications politically. So, Roger, can you tell us a little bit about this book? Yes, the story began uh, back in the summer of 2014 when the authors, who uh, are both Princeton economists, one of them is um, a Nobel laureate, Angus Deaton, were doing some research on suicide statistics and noticed that the rate for middle-aged white Americans had rid- risen very rapidly beginning around 1999-2000. And... Um, they were, you know, made curious by this, so they wanted to put it in context, and they uh, went to the um, Center for Disease Control and uh, downloaded some broader mortality statistics and discovered that it wasn't just suicides, but all kinds of deaths that were rising among middle-aged whites. And as they say, this is a very unusual thing because death rates have been falling and people have been... Uh, living longer and getting more healthy for pretty much the last couple centuries uh, without interruption. So um, it was a very unusual thing that was happening to a specific group, middle-aged whites. They discovered that most of the increase that was not due to suicide was due to either drug overdoses or alcoholic liver disease. And the, the, as, as they point out, the thing that these three kinds of deaths have in common is that they're self-inflicted. Suicide is self-inflicted all at once, but drug overdoses and alcoholic liver disease are a kind of gradually self-inflicted death, too. So they knew they had come upon an important story, and and they uh, wrote it up. I think Anne Case, the, the woman, was the first to make public the uh, this information, And she got beat up by it, by her colleagues who made clear to her that they were not supposed to be working on white people, although white people are the ones who are dying. You know, this this increase has not appeared among blacks or other non-white groups. Well, what was the rationale for that reaction? Simple anti-white bias? I guess so. I mean, they didn't explain it. it, It's something that... I, I found this in um, an interview that they gave with the Washington Post. The journalist asked them about this, and, and uh, they said that they were badly beaten up by very senior people for daring to work on whites, and that's all they say. So I don't, I don't know the rationale, but you know that's the, that's just the general attitude now inside the academy that it's somehow wrong to work on whites. Of course, it's pretty hard to talk about deaths of dis- rising deaths of despair for any other group because the other groups aren't rising. It is a specifically white problem. Where are these deaths of despair happening? What kinds of people specifically are being affected by it? Is it more men or women? Is it more rural or urban? What are some of the demographic details about the victims? Well, as as regards the sex ratio, it's about first of all there are more men who die of these things of suicide and and drug overdoses and and alcoholism than women uh, on an ordinary basis, and the the uptick has involved both sexes, men somewhat more than women, but you know in about the same ratio that ordinarily occurs. So it doesn't. It, it seems that the uptick is not really gender specific in any way now as to the kind of white people who are di- one thing they discovered is a very strong connection with a lack of tertiary education J- for some reason and you know they they debate about this and we can talk about it it seems that it's not 
affecting people with four-year college degrees who are about at present about one-third of the white population. This group, their death rates have not really gone up or have done so only trivially, whereas those with incomplete college education or even more so those with just a high school education are being badly hit by it. Now, partly in connection with that, you can guess at some of the geography. It tends not to be hitting whites in big east and west coast urban cities very much. They tend to have college degrees. The worst hit state happens to be West Virginia, followed by Kentucky, which borders on West Virginia, and a couple of other southern states, I believe uh, Arkansas and Mississippi are, are the worst hit states. And the only, the only states that don't seem to show any rise are states with highly educated white populations like California, New York, New Jersey, Illinois with the Chicago area in it. Those, those are all uh, home to large cities with above average levels of, of uh, completed schooling, and they haven't really been affected. Most of the rest of the country is affected more or less with these heavily rural and heavily working class uh, places like Appalachia and the South being especially hard hit. What is educational level correlated to here? What is it a proxy for? Is it a proxy for IQ? for income, for the kind of jobs that people have? Yeah, it's, it's probably probably a proxy for IQ and income more than anything else. I mean, as, as I uh, said when I reviewed this book, it's hard to imagine that there's anything in the actual course of studies at uh, American universities nowadays that would protect people from this. It's rather that uh, so many jobs now um, – a bachelor's degree is is made a requirement, even even when there's no rational basis for it. They just, you know, it's it's a way. Frankly, it's a way of cutting down the, the enormous mountains of uh, resumes that business people have to deal with in making hi- hiring decisions. So they just they just restrict their search to people who who finish college, and so those those people are are indeed getting better jobs. In fact. Uh, there's something they call it the college premium. Back in the 1970s, if you went to co- if you completed college, you could expect to earn about 40 percent more than somebody with just a high school education. Nowadays, the figure has risen to 80 percent, and so un- unemployment and underemployment are very heavily concentrated among the less. I don't know, want to say the less educated, but the less schooled at any rate. You know, people who have have not spent their early adulthood pursuing tertiary education. They're the ones who are, who are hit the worst by globalism. Many of them are working worse, worse jobs than their fathers and grandfathers did. You know, they, they give a, the authors, Case and Deaton, give a very interesting sort of retrospective account of what life was like for working class Americans back in the 50s. And uh, it, it would sound like some kind of vision of lost paradise, I think, to a lot of these whites today, they would graduate from high school, marry their sweetheart and, and get a unionized job down at the auto plant or or some other manufacturing job. They'd make a pretty decent income. They could raise a family, even take the family on vacation uh, for a couple of weeks in the summer. I think their health care was covered and it was not a bad life. They could buy a freestanding house. You know, it was a modest a modest middle class existence, but they called it the American dream, and it's now out of reach of these people's grandchildren. You know, they they nowadays instead of working for a unionized manufacturing job, uh, a lot of the people doing working class jobs actually work for I don't know if there's a name for this kind of company outsourcers. There, uh, a lot of companies outsource their their menial tasks. To these work suppliers like rent a janitor and you know rent a cleaner or rent a security agent, and they'll work for these companies that rent them out to other companies. Unlike their grandfathers, they don't really have any chance of advancement since they're not working for the company where they're doing their work. So there's suicide, there's drug addiction. Yes. There's also a lot of obesity and heart disease. These are factors as well. Do you want to run through some of those? 
Yes, actually, the the biggest single cause of deaths of despair is uh, drug overdoses, which is largely uh, opiates, uh, what were originally prescription opiates, such as Oxycontin, Vicodin, Percocet is another one. Drugs that were widely prescribed, at least until uh, just a few years ago, uh, when public perception began that they were causing a lot of problems, and they're much less often prescribed now. But uh, but to a great extent, you know, the illegal market has taken over from the legal market. So drug overdoses are the number one form of deaths of despair. Suicide is second. Uh, Alcoholic-related diseases, especially liver disease, is third. Somebody who read one of Case and Deaton's early papers pointed out that even those three forms of self-inflicted death put together are not quite enough to account for all of the rise in white mortality. So they went searching for a fourth factor, and it appears to be a slowdown in progress against heart disease. Uh, more people are dying of heart disease than than we would expect. Now, this can have a number of underlying causes. One of them is obesity. Case and Deaton say that eating too much, like drinking too much, is for some people a reaction to stress and a way of self, self-soothing in the face of life's difficulties and disappointments. So deaths associated with obesity could perhaps also be included in deaths of despair. So the heart disease angle covers about 15 percent. It's the fourth largest type of death of despair. And I did a little little bit of independent research. I looked up obesity statistics for last year, and I and I found out that they overlap very uh, significantly with Case and Deaton's map of the white death. It's places like Kentucky and West Virginia and, and Arkansas. They're seeing the biggest rise in obesity. Obesity is also associated with poverty in America, unusually, but that's, you know, symptom of our affluence. And uh, so, yeah, I think I think that's probably another big factor, though they don't uh, they don't go into it in detail. So what role does the opioid epidemic play in the rise of white mortality? The increase in opioid use began quite legally around 1990. There was a movement to devote more attention to combating unnecessary pain in in medical patients. It was argued that when patients take opioids to combat pain, it rarely leads to addiction. Before this time, pain was treated with a combination of non-opioid medications uh, and counseling and exercise. It was a rather time-intensive, labor-intensive System. It's much, doctors are under a lot of time constraints now, and it was easier for a doctor just to prescribe a pill. So that's that's how uh, the opioid problem began. Um, in 1995, the FDA approved uh, a substance called oxycodone, marketed by Purdue Pharmaceuticals under the name OxyContin. It had a a 12-hour slow-release mechanism, which the manufacturers claimed could allow pain sufferers to sleep through the night. Unfortunately, the pain returned, and opioid withdrawal began short of 12 hours in a lot of people, and so physicians responded by shortening the interval to eight hours or increasing doses, doses, and at at this point, uh, addiction became a problem. Doctors prescribed OxyContin and certain similar drugs like Percocet and Vicodin for all kinds of routine pain. Sometimes they would not even hear if there were problems. If their patient became addicted or even died of an overdose, they would never get word. To get a sense of just the scale of the abuse, there was one town of 400 people in West Virginia that had 9 million pain pills shipped to the local pharmacy over a two-year period. So a lot of people were using these these pills, uh, abusing these pills, people who didn't really any longer have any need for pain because opioids sometimes produce a general sense of well-being as well. You know, that's why, why people use morphine and heroin. The annual deaths began rising. It was only in about 2011 that people realized that something serious was amiss. In that year, 
the uh, the death toll for prescription opioids reached 14,583. And so doctors began uh, to stop or to ease up on uh, prescribing these opioids, which essentially amounted to a kind of legalized heroin. But by that time, the problem was had grown too big to stop. It's, uh, the genie was out of the bottle. And in fact, at a lot of pain clinics, uh, pushers, illegal dope pushers, would start hanging around the parking lot to cater to uh, to patients who's who had failed to get prescription renewals from their doctors. So even as the annual death count from prescription opioids began to decline, the total overall number of uh, opioid deaths continued to rise for at least six years afterwards. In 2017, uh, over 47,000 Americans died of opioids. Uh, when the U.S. Drug Enforcement Administration tried to do something to stop abuse, Congress actually passed a law just as recently as 2016 called Ensuring Patient Access and Effective Drug Enforcement Act, which basically made it impossible for the uh, Drug Administration to do anything against uh, against opioid abuse. The pro-business interests were getting more attention from the congressmen than the, the people who were addicted or dying of opioids. In fact, as Case and, Case and Deaton report, there's a kind of a revolving door that operates between government and, and big pharma. One DEA lawyer actually switched sides to advise the industry and help write the 2016 bill, which uh, only made the opioid crisis worse. So it was it was only about last year that widespread public indignation caught up with the industry. The Sacklers, who own Purdue Pharma, were being lionized as philanthropists. They had their names on all kinds of art galleries and museums and universities. Just within the last year or so, a lot of these organizations have stopped using their name. Some have said that they will not accept any more money. But the Sacklers only gave back a couple billion out of several tens of billions that they made off of what I, as I said, was essentially legalized heroin. In May of last year, just a year ago, five executives at a company called Insys Therapeutics were convicted on racketeering charges. Their salesmen were bribing doctors to, pre- to prescribe fentanyl a drug 30 times as strong as heroin to patients who didn't need it. So that's a, that's a, that's a sign, another sign of the sheer scale of the abuses. And it's probable that uh, some of these pharmaceutical companies are going to be bankrupted by, by lawsuits. Others, on the other hand, are, are, are likely to profit from the way you get people off drugs is sometimes to switch them to a less dangerous drug. It's called medicated assisted treatment. And now, uh, Purdue Pharmaceutical has just been granted a patent for, uh, some kind of drug that's used to help people get off opioids. So they're going to profit both going and coming, causing the problem and then <laughs> helping us get over it. Are doctors being indicted? Uh, obviously, People who are working for pharmaceutical companies can't get doctors to prescribe things that aren't needed unless doctors cooperate. Doctors yes. really need to be sued over this. Are there are there cases of malpractice? In some cases, like the doctors who took took uh, bribes to prescribe fentanyl, that's obviously criminal. Uh, probably in most cases, it's not a matter of uh, deliberate criminal activity. But as I said, uh, a matter of doctors being pressed for time, they got they may have hundreds of patients now, and it's just hard to give personalized treatment to each one. It's so easy to prescribe a pill, and uh, there's also there was a lack of feedback. As I said, when doctor when things would go wrong, doctors would sometimes not hear, you know, not be able to change their behavior in time. In most cases, it's in, it's not criminal, but it's uh, a matter of poor judgment or judgment under 
under insufficient conditions of insufficient knowledge, as so often happens. There's a lot of blame to go around, and there are a lot of people, you know, also um, a lot of blame attaches to people who are perfectly well-meaning. As I say, the whole problem began in the 90s with uh, an effort to uh, prevent needless pain, to devote greater resources to preventing needless suffering. Obviously, nothing uh, nothing to criticize there, but you know that that also contributed to the nom. So the criminals, the criminals are a kind of a outlying fringe. Uh, there, there certainly has been criminal activity, but a lot of it is just a question of misjudgment and insufficient knowledge. The question, though, remains: Why are white people being affected more by opioids than say blacks? Yes, yes, exactly. Um, just very recently, just the last couple of years, there has, the blacks have discovered fentanyl. So the white death is becoming a little less exclusively white. But um, for something like, you know, almost three decades, it, it was almost an, entirely a white problem. And it seems that um, th- that what you got to look at there is the authors say there are two sides to the, the opioid epidemic. There's the supply side, which we've just been talking about, which is the pharma companies the doctors, the congressmen, and then there's the demand side, uh, all these white people who are looking to medicate themselves because they have distressed lives. Um, you know, they're, they're unemployed or underemployed. Um, they're, some of them may be victims of divorce, you know, people who don't have any family to go home to. And so uh, under those conditions – uh, you know, what, what can you really do except to try to numb your own pain? That's why people take opioids or take to drink or take to eating too much. You know, it's, it's when you don't have rational activity to occupy you, then you concentrate on feeling good. And that's really what led to this problem. We got a lot of, a lot of white people. They may not be starving or, you know, but they, their lives, they don't have any very good way of living constructive lives. They have lousy jobs with no prospect for advancement. They don't have families. They're alienated from their communities, from their faith communities. You know, they're living in uh, social isolation, the, the kind of thing that Robert Putnam described in Bowling Alone, which is also a book cited by Case and Deaton. Interesting. So what are the causes of white decline, according to these authors? And do they take into account things like globalization, both shipping yes. industries overseas and also the immigration of cheap labor into America? Because it seems to be the people who are most targeted by outsourcing factories and importing cheap labor who are having these problems. And the the decline of white working and middle class living standards due to globalization would seem to be the major factor here. So how do these authors explain that? Well, unfortunately, the worst part of their book is the the section dealing with immigration. Uh, they they know a little bit about outsourcing. They don't even say too much about that. They have an odd choice for chief chief villain in the uh, story, which is the American medical system. Uh, They point out that we devote like 18% of our GDP to to medical expenses, uh, twice as much as a lot of other countries, and uh, we don't, you know, we we could, they they, uh, figure that we could probably save at least one-third, maybe half on on medical expenses. But see, undoubtedly, we have a very inefficient and and, uh, and, uh, cumbersome and expensive medical system. They make a very good case for that. But that doesn't do anything to explain, as as you say, why whites specifically are doing it, because the the medical establishment is a drag on everyone. it would be it would have made much more sense to look into immigration. But uh, I actually read you the first two sentences of their brief, brief section on immigration, because it, it's a perfect expression of the elite consensus on immigration. This is what they this is how they start off. 
Popular accounts of job loss often blame immigrants for stealing jobs. Populist politicians stoke people's fears about immigration, not only in America, but also in much of Europe. Now, those two sentences beg a lot of questions. First of all, uh, they picture, they, they, they express a lot of concern about white working pl- class people all through the rest of the book. But here they picture them as like stupid Neanderthals who just uh, dislike foreigners because they think they're stealing their jobs. Frankly, I think most Americans are intelligent enough to put the blame where it uh, where it belongs, which is with our policymakers. Right. Exactly. And they also seem to they seem to think that nobody nobody in public life is sincerely in favor of reducing immigration to benefit American people. They picture anyone who opposes uh, a mass immigration as a power hungry demagogue who on the make who is using this issue to accumulate power in his hands rather than to actually benefit the country. And for some reason, that that explanation is never called upon when you have to explain why some politicians are in favor of open borders. Yeah, exactly. It would be more objective for them to simply cite the fact that your first semester of microeconomics is all you need to know in yes. order to predict that as you increase the supply of labor, you're going to decrease the value of labor. That's all you need to know. Yes, exactly, exactly. They do manage to concede that having more workers to compete with can reduce wages, but uh, they they doubt whether they, they they don't seem to want to recognize that that's what's happening in America. I mean, we got what is it, fifteen percent of Mexico living in within our boundaries now, or something like that. It's a very abnormal situation. Yeah, they're obviously treading very carefully because this is a politically correct hot button issue. They're they're putting everything in scare quote, quotes basically, yes, and trying yeah. to trying to basically dismiss the concerns. Uh, they're trying to make it subjective, and it's not a subjective perception. It's a real problem based yeah. on basic laws, uh, basic microeconomic laws. Yes, right, right. And one of these authors has a Nobel in economics, so, you know, they, they ought to be able to grasp this. Why why they're so... Skittish. ...is hard for me to understand, yeah. They're even conventional enough to use the term white privilege a couple of times and, and talk about continuing racism and blah, blah, blah. Well, white privilege doesn't seem to be helping all these white people who are suffering increased mortality. This is where white privilege hits the wall of facts. Uh, it's right. kind of breathtaking that they're going to trot that notion out in this context. Right. As I say, they did get in a lot of trouble just for presuming even to say anything about whites, as if the death of what they estimate is about 600,000 white um, working class white Americans is something that deserves to be studied. That's apparently considered quite controversial in their milieu. Yeah, well, academia is one of the worst places in our culture, and it's certainly one of the most anti-white places in our culture. You have to give these people some credit for the courage they did show in actually writing about this. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. So let's talk a bit about the family. One of the things that seems to be going on with white working class people is almost a kind of Africanization of their family patterns. It's very much like black families in America, the the breakdown of marriage, serial monogamy, children being born out of wedlock and so forth. Can you comment a bit about that? I I found that to be very disturbing. Case and Deaton uh, make some interesting points about the way that the urban black problems of a generation ago prefigured today's problems uh, of working class whites. In the late 60s, blacks in the in American cities were employed in older industries like manufacturing and transportation. Of course, with the rise of the information economy and with foreign competition and outsourcing, the the switch from manufacturing to services, a lot of those jobs that blacks were dependent on disappeared. The manufacturing left the cities, and 
the most talented blacks often went with it, helped by the recent uh, anti-discrimination in housing laws. So the people who were left were the less talented blacks, and they didn't have any jobs. And that's what gave rise to the crack ed- epidemic of the 1980s that did such harm. And, and also, you know, the, the since men are not particularly marriageable if they don't have jobs, women stopped getting married and just uh, started giving birth out of wedlock in response to the incentives that we all know. And then fatherlessness, of course, is a factor in, in a lot of black underclass pathologies that we're familiar with. Uh, so what uh, what happened to whites just in the last generation is in some ways similar. Now, the authors, of course, are not racial realists, but uh, there are structural similarities. Uh, jobs in, in rural locations for less, less educated, le- less uh, skilled whites disappear, and so marriage goes down the drain. Women stop getting married, or they, they switch to serial cohabitation. Many men are left out of the marriage market entirely. And so people uh, turn to drugs, turn to opioids. The, the whites turn to Oxycontin in the same way the blacks turn to crack under these conditions. And um, I believe the authors said that uh, in the 19... Just within the last generation, the percentage of whites with only a high school diploma, white men with only a high school diploma who uh, are married has gone down by about 20 percent from 82 percent to 62 percent, which is where it is today. This is an awful lot of men without much to do with their lives, uh, unable to have children, unable to have any long term relation with a woman. And so you're getting the same a lot of the same pathologies, fatherlessness abandonment, women who are trying to attract a, a man while already trying to raise another man's child, and you get a lot of loneliness, a lot of frustration, and uh, an attempt to, you know, since people don't have any rational use for their time, since they're not raising the, the next generation, uh, they turn to simply doing things that will make them feel good, like taking opioids, drinking, or even overeating. One of the things that we've talked about before is the sort of paradox of how people really don't become marriageable uh, oftentimes until they are married. Right. Yes, yes, yes. Women don't uh, actually become sensible mothers until they get pregnant. Yes, yes. Oh, this is this is something I've seen happen. You know, the most airheaded women you'd never want to see them raising a child. But then when it happens, natural instinct kicks in and they become better mothers than you would expect. And there's there's a certain debate about uh, marriageable men. To what extent married men earn more because they're married and to what extent they work hard and earn a lot in order to get married. And, and the balance of opinion seems to be for most in most cases, marriage comes first. You know, they, they go out to work. And work hard at their jobs because they've taken on these responsibilities of supporting a, a woman and, and children. But nowadays, you know, I, I've heard I've heard women complain that there's no sense in getting married because the men are just like overgrown children. And when I hear them say that, I think, well, yeah, sure, it, it seems that way. But maybe the reason the men seem like overgrown children is precisely because nobody's married them. Yeah. I mean, people used to marry their high school sweethearts right after right after high school graduation. There'd be all these marriages every year, kids 17, 18 years old. And these were not necessarily the most marriageable men or the or the most men who had proven their ability to support their women. The marriage came first and, and then they grew up and, and and became responsible. So it's true of both sexes. Men become marriageable by by getting married in many cases. Yeah, yeah, I, I, and the complaints about uh, that women today have about men not being marriageable. I mean, how much of this is just sort of the princess and, and the pea kind of spoiled high expectations female that's been raised in the, in a world of feminism? Yeah, and romance fiction about 
billionaires. You notice there aren't many women complaining about how ready they are to be good wives and mothers. Right. You know, it's, it's always the man's fault. But I think, as I say, I think in the case of both sexes, we are instinctual creatures. Women become good mothers by becoming mothers, and men become good providers by getting married and becoming husbands and fathers. And once the old system breaks down, uh, it's pretty hard to reconstruct it from scratch. But I think there's a lot of truth in what you're saying, that the uh, maybe both sexes are spoiled to a certain extent. Well, I think a lot of people think that they should keep their options open. Right, right. And, you know, keeping your options open forever, as I uh, wrote somewhere, is like the definition of celibacy. Yeah, yeah. And celibacy leaves a lot to be desired. Yeah. So what policy changes do these authors recommend in their book to help deal with the white death? Most of them have to do with reforming the medical system. As I say, that's, you know, they, they have a good point that our uh, America's medical system is much too expensive. We could save, I think they proved that uh, the average household could save thousands of dollars every year if we had a, a system similar to other developed countries such as Switzerland or Canada. But that doesn't explain, of course, why it is that uh, whites are dying. I'm sure that there's a lot that can be done to improve all Americans' lives by doing something about the, our cumbersome medical system. They're not very good on the subject of race in general. They, they report a Pew survey that more than 50% of white working class Americans believe discrimination against whites has become a big problem, as big a problem as discrimination against blacks and other minorities. You know, when I read that, I think, what's wrong with the other 50%? Don't, you know, don't, don't people know, don't they see that uh, every company has to hire so and so many people of this and that flavor? to avoid lawsuits and that this is very bad for for white men who would like to start families. Here again, as with immigration, their viewpoint is utterly conventional. They think that white belief in that we are being discriminated against is an optical illusion caused by our loss of privilege. They cite a sociologist who writes that this is whites didn't consider their status until uh, their privilege was lessened by legislation in the last few decades. And so uh, the, the new equality seems like inequality to whites. You know, it's basically it's it's saying that anti-white discrimination is like an optical illusion. Yeah, but the rising white death tolls due to deaths of despair is not an optical illusion. Exactly. Something that's not real can't be the cause of something real. Exactly, exactly. Right. You know, I, I wondered when I read this quote from the, the sociologist about whites losing their privileges is, is, you know, you could just as well make the argument that anti-white bias is so entrenched in universities that it has become invisible to academics and that calls for dispossessing whites sound like some kind of devotion to justice and equality. You know, that's that's uh, mm -hmm. that, that's their particular perceptual bias that seems a lot a lot more plausible to me than the idea that, that whites are just working class whites are just imagining that their jobs are being given to women and, and Mexicans and blacks instead of themselves right I did a paper called the very idea of white privilege and I looked at the famous unpacking the invisible knapsack essay oh, yes. by Peggy McIntosh and I looked at what constituted white privilege in her estimation, and really it broke down into two categories. One was simply what you would expect if you have a homeland. Yes, yes. So, for instance, the people around you speak your language, you can understand them, uh, the Band-Aids are the right color for your skin. Yes. You, you can get a haircut, et cetera, et cetera. The, that's just what you have by having a homeland. And the other things basically boil down to not being black. <laughs> and it was, it was a really disappointing analysis when you actually look at it because the assumption that the very concept of white privilege means, implies 
something unjust, right? right. Something that's unequal and therefore unjust. And we like to see everybody have their own homeland. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Something yeah. unequal and unjust that you just inherit. But why is something you inherit necessarily unjust? If everybody has a homeland, then there's nothing unequal ab about that. Right. And the idea that you, we're deconstructing white privilege is really just boils down to we're making a society where whites and nobody else feels at home. But it's always at the expense of whites. Mm -hmm. Right. We're, we're losing a sense of having a place that's our own. And we're being constantly bombarded by negative anti-white messages. That has to be alienating and depressing to people. Sure, sure. Well, the left has always been opposed even to uh, inheritance laws. I, I guess the, you know, the idea of inheritance seems unjust to them, but the alternative would be that we'd have to like rebuild civilization from scratch every generation or so. I mean... Tr truth to tell, we're all privileged to have had ancestors who have left us something decent. Yeah, exactly. I would like to see the various minority groups in America have that for themselves, although not not in my own country. Not at your expense. Yeah, right, right not at my expense. Exactly, exactly. I'd like to see an, a, a world of homelands, just as you would. Yeah, I, I think that really the problem here with white Americans, and specifically the most vulnerable white Americans, the most economic vulnerable white Americans yes. is they are the, the first people who are really feeling the negative effects of globalization in the economic realm and also the destruction of their homelands by diversity and, but, and also simply by anti-white propaganda, by the, the constant bombarding of people with anti-white messages. Clearly, if you drum into white people the message that they are racist people who have benefited from privileges and therefore we're responsible for all the, the miseries of other groups, some people, the most fragile, the most impressionable, are, are going to suffer terrible mood disorders and depressions mm -hmm. and maybe even off themselves. They might kill yeah. themselves. And it seems like that's happening on a much larger scale than anybody suspected. Right. Uh, so the answer to this seems to be populism for white people. It seems to be yes. white identity politics. It seems to be pushing back against globalization, pushing back against immigration. And we have to shut these people's lying mouths in academia right. and the media who are broadcasting this unrelenting message of hatred and denigration towards whites. You know, one of the reasons a lot of uh, elite whites buy into it, though, is is they a situation has been created where elite whites' identity is based to some extent on the contrast between themselves and the 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 rednecks back home who you know don't can't talk about intersectionality and so forth, and so. Um, well, it's a lack of racial consciousness is what it is, obviously. Elite whites define themselves not as members of the white race, but by contrast with what is, after all, the majority. You know, I mean, two-thirds of, of whites don't have college degrees. Right. Yeah. It's the American class system where upwardly mobile or just very objectively privileged, yeah, right. financially privileged white people make themselves feel superior by by denigrating other white people the wrong kind of white people right and there is this marriage between capital and anti-racism that has taken place where the oligarchs now can basically style themselves as progressive champions by simply being anti-white and quote-unquote anti-racist yeah yeah, exactly. It's it's a kind of signaling behavior as, as people are are becoming aware now, and it doesn't doesn't really, of course, it doesn't really do anything for non-whites. At the at, at at best, it just harms our own people. Yeah, yeah. So, 
What are the takeaways of this book as far as you're concerned for white identity politics? And also, do you think this is going to have positive effects on the culture at large, on academia, on public policy and so forth? Has has it been well received? Well, I don't think I don't think the general public has responded in the way that the their fellow academics did in scolding them for talking about whites. The story has gotten out there now that that there is a, a massive problem with the white working class. And certainly you would think that the election of Donald Trump would wake up a lot of people to this. You know, this is the kind of thing that is, it really isn't supposed to happen. Elections are pretty well stage managed by public relations experts. And lo and behold, somebody that none of the experts wanted actually got into office because the uh, great unwashed, the, the rednecks, uh, decided they wanted somebody else. It's an important book, and I expect it'll have more positive consequences than negative, but it does have some rather serious flaws, you know, a total inability to understand the immigration issue, uh, almost complete inability to understand uh, racial issues. I think the business about the American medical system, while it's not objectionable, is to some extent a red herring. It's not, it's, it, it, as I say, it does not explain the white death. It explains a lot of bad things. Obviously, the opioid epidemic is, uh, is a sign that something is wrong with our medical system. But it's not, it shouldn't be the chief villain as they make it. I think the, it may be the longest chapter in the book is devoted to trashing the American medical system. Yeah, that that's interesting. Yeah, it, it clearly is something that could be fixed, but it's not going to fix yeah. the problem specifically of white people. Right, right. So have people on the right, people of the populist persuasion, have have they been taking up this book and making use of it? What what kind of reception is it? That had? I don't know. I I actually ought to look into that. The book has only been out since March. Um so there it, it perhaps hasn't been enough time yet to gauge its effects. Has, didn't Countercurrents publish a review, or are you doing that? We haven't published a review yet. I think I have seen other reviews on sites friendly to us, but uh, I'll, I'll, I'll monitor that. It'll be interesting to see um, where it goes, where the discussion goes. I think it's a very, very important publication, even if it gets the answers wrong, even if it somewhat flubs things <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> in predictable ways. Yeah. The fact that it was published obviously against the current of academic opinion and by two people who are at Princeton University, one of whom yes. is a Nobel laureate. It's this is good. I mean, th- this cannot be ignored. It's amazing that it took 15 years for anybody to notice this, to notice this spike in deaths of of, of working class whites. But it began around you know, around the end of the last century, around 1999, they say, and it's continuing. It continues to rise, while uh, like the the mortality rate of other groups continues to decline. As they pointed out, one of the reasons people got mad at them was that black death rates are somewhat higher than white rates. They've always been, uh, but black death rates are continuing to descend. Just a generation ago, the black death rates were about twice that of whites. Now they're only about 20 percent higher. So if, if all you're concerned about is racial equality, maybe you consider that good. But uh, it also means that uh, over half a million whites are dead who would otherwise be uh, alive and productive. And, uh, and, and also, you know, if you've read your Phil Rushton, you know that blacks are a less K-selected race. So you would expect them to have somewhat higher mortality rates than whites. And it's true all over the world, not just in America. So it can't just be discrimination. It's right. true of the rates between Africa and Europe, you know. Yeah, there's somewhat more accident prone. Yes. Well, this has been very, very interesting. I really want to, I want to monitor the situation to use a unfortunately fashionable term. Like President Trump, like we, we'll, we will monitor the situation and maybe report on it again, huh? Yeah, yeah, exactly. I I do think that this is a a positive sign that this book has been published uh, by Princeton, no less, by by a Nobel laureate. So I hope it just doesn't get buried in silence. I hope it doesn't get the silent treatment. That would be an unfortunate thing. Roger Devlin, it's always a pleasure to have you on the show. 
and we shouldn't let so much time go by before we have you back again. So thank you so much. Thank you.